Hi, welcome to another session with Academy. I'm Annette Foster and I am a white person with long blonde hair, blue eyes and an oval face. I have a black jumper on and I'm sitting in a somewhat pretty much white room with a just lone bookcase in the back, a very small bookcase in the background. <laughs> um, I am here today um, with Bobby Elman and Tanya Atkins. Would you guys mind giving us a physical description? Bobby, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I'm also a white middle-aged woman, mm -hmm. um, but with like sort of reddy, kind of purpley, pinky, I don't know what colors that are going on in my hair. Um, black ring glasses, um, a black uh, shirt, in a room that is blurred out, but it's kind of pink with a very big bookcase in the background. Yeah, thank you. So I am a white woman. I have my hair tied back, it's kind of blonde. I'm wearing glasses and I'm wearing a green leopard print shirt in a rather colorful room, which has got gold and green wallpaper and a teal wall. Thank you very much, Tanya. So today we are discussing autistic hyper empathy, um, but first we always ask a few questions of our guests. So the first question for you is, who are you and what is your one of your dedicated interests or specializations? Um, and obviously we know there's loads that lots of people mm -hmm. have. So who wants to go first? Bobby, you want to go first since I did that? Um, sure. I'm Bobby. I'm... Um... I call myself a uh, consultant and trainer of the autistic experience. Um, I've been doing it for sort of around 16 years. Um, I have a post degree in autism. My special interest is 100% <laughs> the autistic experience currently and has been for probably 20 years. Um, but other than that, it's music. I'm really, really into music these days again. Mm. Fabulous. Yeah. Cool. And Tanya? Yep, so my name is Tanya, as I've said before. Um, God, what is my special autistic specialization? A little bit like Bobby. So I'm a consultant, trainer, and advocate. I've been working specifically with and for autistic people for about seven years now, I think, and previous 10 years before that with various other different groups. And what's my, um, I'm very driven by injustice. So anything that's relating to autistic experience and injustice, I think for the past year or so, it's been heavily influenced by social care and social care law. So at the minute, it's a lot of FII, so fabricated induced illness. Um, and I think one of the biggest passions is probably educating people, especially um, autistic people about what it means to be autistic and helping them make life a little easier for themselves so that's probably one of my biggest driving passions it's fabulous i i, I share that passion as mm -hmm. well as <laughs> um a lot of people do here at academy so yeah so our second question when did you discover you were autistic bobby do you want to go ahead um slightly before the pandemic hit Definitely. And it's, it's, it's hysterical because like I did a degree in autism with autistic lecturers and turned out to be friends and autistic people on the course. And every one of them had like said to me, well, we kind of assumed you were, but it kind of didn't hit me regardless of the fact that I have a 21 year old and a 23 year old hmm, autistic um, until I was in my fifties, literally around beginning of my fifties. Um, and it was, at first, a bit of a shock and kind of like I felt really, really ignorant. Like I felt really like I should have known this. Like, why didn't I see this years ago? Um, and then I kind of went, you go through all these sort of stages about it, don't you? And um, and at oh. the end, it's your acceptance. Absolute and unbelievable acceptance. And there's beauty in that. Absolute mm -hmm. beauty in that. Yeah, That's I think I was about... 29 or so um it was yeah um supposedly because i'm a parent as well and uh, my eldest son started having some difficulties in school um so like any un unaware autistic person would do i hit the law books and was like okay this should be happening this should be happening this should be happening and then you know started 
learning more about autistic experience and all the research and stuff and just had that light bulb moment so yeah yeah and then it was just like oh, that makes so much sense but off the back of it now um you know because that was that's coming up to nine years now oh, I feel old now but um yeah but off the back of that um you know my dad's been able to he's always struggled with being told mental health so he's now identified as autistic ADHD my brother my sister and I think one of my nieces is just about to go down that path as well so yeah, yeah. whole autistic family even my grandma wow. has been like hang on a minute <laughs> <laughs> catalyst for change which is yeah. amazing as well yeah definitely that's amazing well thank you for for sharing that both of you so yes today um we are discussing autistic hyper empathy um which i think is an incredibly fascinating um topic really and i'm excited to hear more about it um mm. Yeah, so Bobby, I think you've got a presentation to share with us. Is that? Fabulous? Yeah, I do. And I'm not sure if you share it first because I'm not able to do it from there. Oh, we go. There, we there go. it goes. Look at that. It's like magic. It's Yay. It's magic. <laughs> So um, I'm, I'm not necessarily an a, a academic or anything, but I, I love myself a PowerPoint. PowerPoints give me sort of visual focus for what I'm going to talk about. So um, as I said, it's hyper empathy in, in the autistic experience. And I'm Bobby Elman. And I always do an agenda because I think it's nice to let people know what, what I'm actually going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about what is empathy and the different parts of, of, of what makes up empathy. So you have effective empathy. We're going to go into hyper empathy. Want to look at alexithymia, cognitive empathy, double empathy comes in after that, I believe. Um, and then pathological demand avoidance or demand avoidance, as I prefer, exposure anxiety, which I believe is a, is a type of that. Um, and then compassion and empathy, some of the dangers and kind of what we can do. Um, so what do we mean by empathy? And forgive me, I'm getting over COVID so I can get a little bit breathless sometimes. So what do we be more empathy? It's the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Early 20th century from the Greek, empathia from M in and pathos meaning feeling. And it makes up three parts, effective, cognitive, and compassionate. Effective empathy, and what we're talking about with that is the feelings, the emotions, that immediate thing that happens sort of when um, you have an emotion. It's an unconscious automatic response and allows us to feel what another living being or another living thing feels. And it can also extend to objects. So personification and the next word I can never say properly. So I'm going to spell it. <laughs> I'm going to try it slowly. Anthropomorphism. Woohoo! Anyway, which means dolls and toys and things like that. Thanks. So I believe hyperempathy comes in when we're talking about the effective empathy, a part of, of empathy. And what, what do we mean about hyperempathy? Hyperempathy is the thought of someone in pain. Seeing someone in pain causes an emotional reaction. So for me personally, I, I can't see somebody in pain. It, immediately I have a reaction of complete fear and I have to do something, but I'm not sure what I want, what I can do. So and it can go from mild to an intense feeling. It can actually even be painful. You can pick up somebody else's vibes, the tension in a room, and it can increase and escalate and affect the person more as it, as it does. So the day goes on and it's kind of like it fills up. Um, and it can lead to withdrawal or overload if it's not sort of you know managed or if it becomes too much. So for me, I can't see ugh, anybody crying in a room. If anybody's crying in a room, don't matter if I know you or not, Nine out of 10, I don't know you, but nine out of 10, I'm going to start crying or I'm going to feel like I want to cry. So I have a tendency to mirror um, what I'm, what the emotion is and I can take it inside me so it can be absorbed into me. And that's a really strange feeling because it's not sort of your own feeling. Like you're taking in somebody else's emotion. It doesn't really belong to you. And that can be extremely, extremely confusing. So... <laughs> I think personally, and part of me with the cough, alexithymia comes into this as well. And alexithymia doesn't mean lack of emotions or a difficult, it's difficulty in identifying one's own emotions. Difficulty, Alexa's going off, excuse me. Alexa, stop. Oh 
Oh my God. Every time I say that word, she goes off. Um, difficulty identifying another's emotions, difficulty describing one's emotion, one's own emotions and the emotions of others. But I would personally suggest that it's a non, it's non-autistic language and identifiers of emotions that are possibly limiting to our autistic people and to us. So when we're feeling an emotion that is coming at us from somebody else and we're not necessarily recognizing it, that also can lead to mass confusion, I personally believe. So the other part of empathy is the cognitive empathy, and that's the conscious part. So it's the conscious ability to work out what others are thinking and feeling. Sound familiar? I mean, there, there have been people, certain people we do not mention who wrote whole thesis on this that, you know, and hypotheses on this that have been completely disproven. Anyway, I won't go into it. I'm sure Tony knows exactly who I'm talking about. And so does Annette. Anyway, <laughs> it's in, it's in, in, intricate process that allows one to figure out what somebody else is saying, even if they are vague or behave differently to the words that are spoken. What of those who think and feel and process differently in a non-autistic world? So when it comes to cognitive empathy and it comes to this area, my, my opinion, the reason that these hypotheses such as mind blindness and, you know, theory of mind were written um, was because of not understanding the difference i.e. the alexithymic um, autistic person who thinks and feels differently. So when they're thinking and feeling differently, that obviously is going to affect their cognitive empathy as well. So where do I think comes into play? <laughs> the double empathy comes in perfectly when we're talking about cognitive empathy. And the double empathy is the difficulties in communication and empathy between non-autistic people and autistic people. Flawed cognitive empathy on both sides. So it's a dual thing. It's not like just one side. Oh, sorry. Don't know why that just flipped. There. Nope, it flipped again. Oh, it keeps flipping, and I don't know why. Okay. I'm not touching anything. Double empathy. Huh. <laughs> Mutual incomprehension that occurs between people with different dispositional outlooks. Oh, it keeps flipping people. I'm not doing this. Again. There. Whew. Mutual incomp incomprehension, see, and uh, as soon as I talk, it's flipping. Uh, um, does it have automatic transitions? No. It looks like they're no. trying to keep them. Okay, so anyway, both parties experience it, and it's a lack of translation. Um, look into double, uh, Damian Milton's double empathy um, to look in it further if you don't understand that much about it. There's enough information out of there. So anyway, I'm going to go into how does it affect people with pathological demand avoidance and, and, and what I call exposure anxiety or what my friend Donna Williams called exposure anxiety, which is the um, excruciating sense of audience to one's own existence. So the idea of attention on oneself cannot be tolerated. So I see it as a type of demand avoidance. So I want, I'm asking when, when hyperempathy um, uh, come into, comes into play with PDA and EDA and effect, how do they affect the effective cognitive and compassionate empathy? Um, how does PDA specifically in hyperempathy look like? What does alexithymia in hyperempathy look like? So the double empathy problem, how does that play into it? And, and how can that actually sort of possibly answer some of those questions? And can somebody with pathological demand avoidance or exposure anxiety is alexithymic and, and also be hyper empathetic? I'm going to say yes, because I have two that are exactly that. Exactly that. They feel like their emotions are on their skin. They do not like um, when, when somebody's upset in front of them. They don't know how to handle it. They don't know what to do with the emotion when they were much younger. Um, and it was because they couldn't put a name on that emotion because what they felt was slightly different. So the need for autistic experience in, in, in emotions and having words for them, I think is extremely vitally important. Anyway, I'm babbling. We talked about babbling earlier. I'm babbling now. So when we're talking about compassion and empathy, part of empathy, we're talking about the feeling concern for somebody but with an additional move towards an action to mitigate the problem. It's empathetic concern and it moves us to act to help however we can. Now, I would say, again, my children being hyper empathetic, having to deal with alexithymia, having to deal with exposure anxiety, when it comes to compassion and empathy, it is all there. But how to deal with it, what to do with it, 
can be problematic for them because they sometimes need the person who is who is who needs to help to tell them how to help them. And if they don't have that, they don't always know what to do next. And that's, again, why I think the stupid theories came into play, but I digress. So what are the dangers that can happen? And it took me like 50 years to come to this. It honestly did. So the dangers are you can attract extremely unhealthy relationships because somebody can understand that you're very, very hyper empathetic and they can feed off of that, specifically a narcissist. And I don't throw that out there lightly. I say that very, very firmly having experience of it, you know, um, and it can lead to abuse in that respect as well. You know, emotional abuse on top of it, because if somebody knows that you're very hyper empathetic and then plays on it, that's an extremely abusive, toxic relationship. It can lead to draining and burnout. Absolutely. Because you're trying to support so many others, but you might not have your own support. You might not be supported. It definitely leads to anxiety, multiple sources of, of, of anxiety um, from worrying to feeling others emotions. I mean, when you're taking on and, and taking in somebody's emotion because you are hyper empathetic, you don't know what to do with that. And that builds up in a day. By the end of the day, you're completely wiped out, you know, and, and it does lead to an emotional outburst or can lead to a meltdown without a doubt. And boundaries, pardon me, too much too soon, knowing where the boundaries lie, having no boundaries at all. Um, and sadly, self-medication and even, you know, addiction can result in it. And it's all based on this idea of, of hyper empathy is, you know, what they call feeling too much. So what can we do? I say understand empathy deeply, hyper empathy, and what it actually means personally to the individual. Because then you can sort of understand how that person works and you're not, you're helping them by not abusing the fact that they're hyper empathetic as well. And I don't say that lightly. Um, work on advocacy. You know, with more understanding comes more acceptance. Help others understand the double empathy problem. Personally, I think that's everything. Like I'm a massive fan of it. Anybody that knows me knows that. But I think it answers so much in, our, in society and how society actually reacts to us. So if they understand the problem, they can work to correct it. And I mean both sides. It's a dual thing. Um, and continue to validate our autistic experience and to continue to talk about them because that's the only way other, people's, other people know that they exist. Um, references, I always include them. Lots of references. Um, that's me, my Facebook, my website, my email, my blog. Um, and thank you very much. And that um, is a 3D um, rendering of somebody that my um, youngest created in media recently and it's part of a game that they're doing. So I had to throw it in oh, there. Wow. Thank you very wow. much. That literally is the end. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. And I go fast and I'm sorry about that. No, no, it was really good. I, I think this is such a huge topic and I have such an interest in it because, you know, in a lot of ways you've described me. I've always been hyper empathetic, um, discovered that I'm alexithymic as well on the scale of alexithymia, but that, that the two cope together. And I've spoken to a lot of people now kind of supporting autistic people. And a lot of people say, can I be both? Um, Cause I feel like I am, um, but there's not really room for that within um, kind of the definition, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, of, of what it means as an autistic person to be empathetic. Tanya, did you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking in my experience, you know, I work with an, an awful lot of children, young people, um, adolescents, even some adults that have like had pretty traumatic times going through mainstream education, etc. Um, and may have a whole host of other issues. But my experience is it tends to be the higher, you know, the, the more difficulty you have with identifying your own emotions, the, the more hyper empathic you tend to be. So I would say, in my experience, the two go hand in hand. Um, you know, I'm lexithymic and I completely struggle to differentiate between what I'm feeling or whether I'm picking it up from somebody else. But instead of thinking that I'm feeling everything, it's always somebody else's feelings until three days later, I realized, and I, oh, this happened. That's my feeling. So I would definitely say the two go hand in hand. And I do wonder as well if it's something that we're born with, like, um, because I always think they think of emotion as a bit of a ninth sense, really, because it's a reaction to some input in a way. 
and it's very much based in sensory regulation. So for me, that just mm -hmm. makes sense in my kind of hyperfant brain. Um, but I do wonder if it's a product of having to mask and having to be very aware of other people and their reactions to you and maybe turning that pattern spotting skill that we've got in some way to tune into other people. So if they're behaving in a way that's unsafe, that immediately makes us unsafe. And really the only thing that we've got to do, I mean, babies do it, babies mirror as a safety mechanism. So really the only thing that we can do is it, is it an extreme form of mirroring? Is it an extreme form of being able to guess what that other person is thinking, feeling, so we can understand what actions are going to be next. So that's always been a bit of a chicken and egg question for me. Yeah, yeah no, it's a good I mean, one. I, think, I think that um, it's 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 really interesting to think about that, and I think that there's there needs to be a lot more research on this, really, mm -hmm. because <laughs> you know it seems that autistic people are trying to figure it out, just uh, you know, <laughs> as we go along. And, you know, I, I remember one time I was speaking at um, this one time at Bandcamp. I don't know. That just came into my head. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was speaking at an event for autistic parents um, and I was describing my experience, which is similar to what Bobby was talking about, of um, kind of like being an emotional antenna of the room, you know, walking into a room and looking around and going, oh, that person's not very happy over there. Oh, that person's really, you know, and not even being able to describe it necessarily. Um, yeah. and, and being very confused about what was my emotions and what were other people's mm -hmm. emotions. But, but and, and a, a parent actually speaking up and saying, you know, my child is, um, doesn't speak at the time, they said nonverbal, but I would say doesn't speak in mouth words. Um, and they said, you know what, I've always felt that about, my my child that they that's they were every time they walked into a room that's what they felt and I thought that was really interesting that you know um, that was kind of a shared experience that we had that I could explain because I speak in mouth words about you know it kind of like oh yeah that is what it is um, and also the people pleasing element of it and I wonder Ooh. yeah it, yeah because it's not like I walk into a room and go, everybody's happy. Cause I tend to take on that. It's my fault that those people are unhappy. I did as a child. I've learning now. That... Yeah. Go well, I'm known as the mediator in, in, in my family growing up. And I can say that now because there's nobody left in my family, but I was known as the mediator and, and same thing with friends. I was constantly medi the mediator. And the reason I became the mediator is fawning people pleasing. It was to make everything just calm down because of, of drinking in that emotion and mirroring that emotion. I, I couldn't mirror it. I wasn't allowed to mirror it in my family. So I just absorbed it. So I became a mediator and masked massively to be able just to go, okay, everybody calm down. Yeah. It's that overwhelming, almost safety need for everybody around you to be in a regulated, okay a state because you cannot cope with it and um, the other thing as well is that if I'm around autistic people that are struggling it's far easier than it is to be around neurotypical people that may not have regulated emotions at, at that time and that's what makes me wonder is, is it to do with the amount of cognitive work that goes into figuring out what's going on and then that need for kind of like emotional safety so you're not kind of picking it up constantly which is really bizarre considering my work because I tend to run towards it as well so it's this constant push pull factor isn't it but yeah um so yeah, high empathy yes yeah I I see it a lot in PDAs as well and or any you know any PDA -er. and I am absolutely sure that PDA especially because of the interceptive differences that we now know come with that kind of profile um I'm wondering if that that kind of demand avoidance or that avoidance of being responsible for other people's emotions or taking that on is rooted very much in in that emotional overwhelm yeah, and I think interception, if people don't know what that means, um, basically that's the awareness of your inside of the body, um, things that are happening, workings of the inside of the body. So that could even be, you know, whether you're 
you know, whether you're hungry, but also whether you're emotionally emo aware of your emotions in relation to that. Um, and I, I wanted to come back if, if, if Chloe could put that or um, put that um, mask back up, because I thought that was important as well, that people, some people can become hyper empathetic due to drama, um, e.g. E e hyper vigilance due to violence. And it's quite interesting because I think so many autistic people experience drama just being autistic in a neurotypical world. So, yeah, you know, it, 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 yeah, once again, the chicken or the egg, you know, or do you have to have yeah. a certain kind of, um, yeah, you know, already I be hyper empathetic to, yeah. No, I, I think it's a really strange one, but it, I agree with what Kira Rose says. I'm yet to meet a non trauma autistic. Mm. Um, I think that makes up a huge part of what neurotypicals would label as traits or symptoms. Um, but yeah, I'm yet to meet a non trauma autistic. So it, it, yeah, um, <clears throat> I'd, it is which comes first, the chicken or the egg. But I suppose really it's like, how do you deal with it? How do you live with it? Because for me, I can remember it wasn't until I was in my 20s. Um, and I still struggle with it now. So mid to late 20s that. And what are boundaries? Because nobody explains what boundaries are, do they? It's just this real abstract concept. And if you've grown up fawning and masking and all the rest of it, I, I often find myself having to explain boundaries. But realistically, it's probably only something myself that I've understood in the past 10 years throughout via my community as well. But um, And that makes it easier to manage. And I think it's always as well coming back to that Bearden's golden equation, do you know, when they talk autism plus environment equals outcome. Um, yeah. yeah, it's understanding that the environment isn't just about the physical. It's about the energy. It's about the things that you're exposing yourself to as well. So that helps. But yeah, it's um, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. I wanted to say, can we bring that comment back up? Because I just wanted to read that out because I thought that was quite good. Um, someone, uh, Charlotte says, hyper empathy feels like hypersensitivity to me. Others' emotions can be overwhelming in the same way I'm sensitive to light and touch, um, which mm -hmm. is very relatable, um, definitely. Um, yeah, and, and um, why I believe it's really important to know that about yourself, you know, understand that about yourself. I'm going to be brutally honest um, because I can, because it doesn't matter. Anybody that knows me isn't going to judge me. There were years that I self-medicated, massively self-medicated, just to be social, just to blunt it out just to not be caught up in all of the emotional drama that happens automatically when you're 20 years old and you're around 20 year old people. Right. And, and not knowing that I was autistic. So I spent years doing that. And it wasn't until, you know, literally thirties and having children and becoming completely, totally, absolutely sober in all sense that suddenly all of the emotions came out and it's like parenthood toppled that. So it didn't have time. So it wasn't, until later in life that I started realizing these things about me because I was told growing up that I was a crybaby because my go-to for any emotion was to cry. So, you know, my, my, my parents thought it was funny to buy a, me a doll when I was very young. That was literally a crybaby face. And I was gutted because I knew mm. that was, that was all about me and that there was something different about me. Had I known and had we had the words of, you know, you're autistic, this is the autistic experience. Don't get me wrong. I am who I am today because of the experiences that I've had. You know what I mean? Don't, don't get me wrong in that respect. But, you know, I'm doing this for those parents out there who see it in their kids. And if you see it in your kid, understand it. Don't shame them for it. Mm. Because in my generation, we were shamed for it. You know, being too sensitive, over emotional, you know, and that's not fair. Mm. It, it, it's not. Sorry. I'm not uh, no, no, that's why it's so important for autistic people, all autistic people, to be taught and to understand about things like alexithymia, whether you think from pictures or not, because that's how I kind of found out that I was alexithymic. I, I'm now found I, I, I don't really think in pictures at all. So, um, and that made me understand myself so much better. You know, so many things about the way I experience the world um are affected by that and for me i have like feelings of things in my head so that's even related to, i think to the hyper empathy like i the way i think is in feelings and feel which is yeah quite mm. fascinating yes. to think about um and for people to understand about boundaries i think so many autistic people just aren't allowed boundaries um mm. and i think every you know autistic person when they discover they're autistic should be you know sat down okay are you like 
what do you think in pictures? You know, um, you know, do you know what boundaries are? And if you don't, you know, we need to teach you. Uh, yeah, Chloe's got the great bite size on boundaries building that um, she put up uh, mm -hmm. a while ago, um, which is really good and important to understand what boundaries mm -hmm. are because most of us, even, you know, late, I, I would say in my 40s, to, still didn't understand what boundaries were. And I boundaries think are... Sorry, Bob's, go on. <laughs> I was just going to say boundaries for me are wrapped up in fawning as well. You know, yeah. it's that people please and respect. Like yeah. that's the last boundary battle that I'm having with myself. Like everything else, yes, toxic toxicity, absolutely I can cut that right out. I'm really good at cutting that right out. Yeah. But when it comes to people that I care about and I love and saying no, oh my goodness me. Mm. Mm. It's like yeah. a lost it's really part. difficult yeah and also i think as well that you know we're, we're brought up to be like you know it's that fawning thing it's it's a culture of kind of fawning and politeness etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's like we're almost brought up to think that you can't have a boundary without being emotionally angry or volatile or you know yeah. so it's just actually somebody i mean i do this a lot with the people that i work with is sit down and go you know what you can say no without having to be emotional or angry mm -hmm. and, and just mm -hmm. practicing ways in which to do that, how to be assertive without having to be heightened in order to be able to get yourself to that point to do it. So that, that's been a really, you know, that a lot of people need teaching that as well, even neurotypical people. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm really good with my clients and, and telling them the same thing, but when it comes to me, <laughs> a little bit harder, you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's I'm sure a lot of people identify with that, you know, that you, you, you can you can tell somebody that advice and you know the advice, but taking it on sometimes um, can be challenging. But, you know, I also have Alostanos and that's when my body takes over. It's like that interception yeah. part. Alostanos takes over and goes, okay, now you're saying no now. I'm going to make you because you're not moving. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or burnout <laughs> hits, or you hit a mini burnout. Yeah, I mean, you know what I mean? That. Yeah, and in with the alexithymia as well, like quite often you don't realize that you should have had a boundary yeah. until it's late. And then you learn. And I always think, you know, we're supposed to make a lot of mistakes, aren't we? But I think the important thing is to try and not make the same mistake too many times. I do all the time. Ask David. Every time I go to the supermarket, I'm like, yeah, let's, let's jump on Zoom and do some writing afterwards. And every single time I'm like, oh, I can't do it. I'm dead. I'm the supermarket. <laughs> too much. Just like, Why? Every single time. And it's just because... It, it just takes so much focus to be that aware of yourself with so much, you know, it comes back down to monotropism, doesn't it? You know, you've got living in a neurotypical world when you've got to think about house and kids and work and friends and all these other things that you are kind of last on the list. So you just literally don't yeah. have the attention tunnels available. So you don't notice. And then when you get ADHD into things, well, we always we're really bad at estimating, you know, just how long something's going to take or, you know, how much how many spoons things are going to take as well. So I think that's a big element of it. So really, I suppose yeah. the way that I would look at, at autistic experience and, and hyper empathy and everything that comes along with it is, is, you know, you have to be a little bit like your own detective. Yes. And you have to keep going back over what happened. And OK, and it might take sometimes it takes me weeks to figure out. I can literally be mid emotional meltdown and um, Mel will be like, are you OK, Tanya? Are you having a burnout? Are you having a meltdown? I'm like, no, no, I'm fine. And then, yeah, figure it out later. But yeah, so community is really important as well. Community and people. Absolutely. Yeah. Somebody that you trust yeah. to be a bit of an emotional barometer is really important because I don't even notice. Um, and I think a lot of my neurokin don't even notice either. We have to say, okay, you're acting a bit like this or your body's doing that. And it's, mm. it's really difficult, but yeah. Sometimes it takes someone else describing the experience that you have to, for you to understand it, which I think is yeah. really important and why community is so great. Um, and you mentioned the word um, monotropism. I just wanted to, in case people didn't know what that meant, basically um, there's a theory um, and there's actually a new website, which maybe we can get the website up um, from about the author of monotropism. And basically it says that autistic people have quite a narrow kind of way of focusing. I don't know. I, I, I got this idea from somebody, somebody was saying, 
uh, on another academy because I obviously watch them as well <laughs> about tendril theory you know that yeah um <laughs> that all your tendrils go into one thing you have all these brain tendrils that kind of yeah. attach to this one thing and it's very difficult so, to unattach those things um mono yeah and it, monotropism in a real kind of basic breakdown is i use no, it you, in everything the basis of apps and um yeah and there's a session coming up with um chloe and kieran in july on monotropism i think i might actually jump on because it's so so my thing <laughs> but basically that we you know we all have a finite amount of attention to give regardless of neurotype but um neurotypical people are polytropic thinkers which means they're able to split that attention in shallow kind of way across various different topics subjects and because they're not deep into it they can flip between each each subject quite quite quickly but autistic people and it makes sense as well because of how much information we take in through our senses um we can't puddle dwell like polytropic thinkers neurotypicals can so we we kind of have to go all in but we've still only got this finite amount of attention so if we're, and we've also got unconscious attention tunnels as well. So we, it's, it's about sensory regulation. Sensory regulation is a massive unconscious attention tunnel from us. It's managing our emotions, figuring out what's ours and what's other people's. So we have to go deep into things and we get into a flow state. And once we're in there, pulling us back out can be incredibly traumatic. So that's inertia. But yeah, go, yeah, definitely looking forward to monotropism because if you get monotropism, you it, kind of builds from there anyway I should be like a salesperson <laughs> <laughs> no it's great it's artistic yeah. movement yeah. somebody said I was working with a lot of autistic people at, 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 in my for my PhD and someone was saying yeah neurotypical people say autistic people don't move but I I think we move more and I think that's definitely the case mm. I think that we actually move more and it's not just stimming it's just to express ourselves which is interesting and yeah there was not a the mask in yeah if we're not leaving yeah. the mask in we're anxious yeah exactly and i think there is a lot of masking of um kind of effective empathy which you talked about first bobby um and i think somebody brought that up in a comment which a couple of comments mm -hmm. um which maybe we can bring back up but i i've know that about myself you know if someone's crying i will cry um mm -hmm. and 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 a lot of times i get upset and i don't even know why that's the other thing mm -hmm. that that you know like very alexithymia but yeah um i think it's really important to kind of talk about those different types of empathy as well because that's so immediate isn't it it's just like yeah. it's so and it's uncontrollable that's the whole point it's uncontrollable it's not something that we can actually control unless we mask and even then we mask it's really hard to maintain that you know what i mean does music do that for you as well like i can't hear, see, hear kids singing or i can't hear if i'm gonna if i need i know i'm building and i'm holding something in and i need to have a good cry but I'm masking too damn hard, excuse my language, I'll throw on a specific piece of music and it's like floods. It's like the angry, stupid, ugly guy. You know what I mean? It, because I know it's, it, it, so when I say music is, 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 is sort of like a, an interest, it's, it's also um, emotional release for me massively, massively. And I use it for emotions as well. I think, um, you know, with, so both of my children's are PDA and um, probably me too, but I have a bit of an atypical reaction to effective empathy sometimes. It makes me almost angry because my first response is always fight. So if somebody else is, not all the time, not all the time, especially if I can fix something, but if I can't, um, it almost makes me angry and agitated because and other people's urgency as well can do that. So I have to be very aware of that and I have to mask that very hard because it almost feels like somebody is demanding emotional spoons from you. And it's not yeah. their fault. And I would never no. act on it, I would never be awful about it, but it can make me very angry when other people are Yeah, upset. and that's part of hyperopathy people don't talk about is that there's areas of triggers. So mm -hmm. I know for a fact if I see a certain type of person, which I won't go into that, um, um, cause trauma with me, mm. I automatically have a reaction to them and, and mm. learning why and learning that I was hyper empathetic and why I was having that reaction 
you know, mm-hmm. that, that's the part that people don't really talk about, that that they can trigger you too. Absolutely but trigger yeah. you. So there's no sense that you got angry with certain sort of demands. Of course it does, or certain, you know, expectations yeah. upon you. I think we almost unconsciously account our own spoons as well. Yeah. So when it comes out of left field and you're not expecting it, that can be incredibly overwhelming as well, because realistically, what we're constantly trying to do is have this internal battle of keeping regulated. That that's part of being autistic is you are constantly learning everything you can about autistic experience, being around Nurkin, learning from your community. Some of us even go to university to learn about it. Um, but And it's all about maintaining your own regulation and yeah. conserving spoon so we we do we do subconsciously account energy for what's happening and i think that's why we need a lot of the time to know what's coming next because i think absolutely. that we absolutely need to we need to you know corner off those spoons so if there's yeah. something that's coming in that's really big and emotional the instant yeah. drive is going to be fix it really quick or for me sometimes get really angry because it feels unconsensual. It feels like a violation sometimes. Yeah, and I think I think I see justice as an artistic emotion as well, and you oh, know yeah. having that strong emotion to that. Um, yeah, and I want to get to this comment as well. I, I think hyper empathy. This is Beth. Makes grief especially yeah. difficult. I have personally found that I feel others grief more than my own and have to be alone in order to feel and process my own grief, which can make the process longer and harder to navigate. Ooh, yeah. I know uh, yeah. this. My mother passed a year ago. And to be honest with you, all of the stuff that I'm dealing with a lot of lawyer mm. detail, a lot of lawyer stuff that I'm dealing with um, has made it so that I have had to compartmentalize this sort of grief for a while. Um, and that's when music like catches me all automatically. All of a sudden, something will come on, and I'm just like, oh, yeah, and I'm there again. Um, so I've yeah. it, it 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 does it a one thousand percent. I believe hyper empathy makes can make grief very 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 difficult and very different. I know I grieve differently. Like I know yeah. I do because when my father passed when I was fifteen years old, and my mother expected me to go to his grave. I was like, why? I didn't see a reason to. That was me personally. Me personally in my brain. Yeah. I could talk to my father whenever I wanted to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I didn't see a reason to go to, to, to a cemetery where there is something etched in stone. Like as far as my, I was concerned, my father wasn't there anymore. So I knew at 15, I was definitely thinking very differently. to everybody else around me who was also grieving, they were grieving in very different ways, very different yeah. ways. I think as well for me, um, it's a little bit of an abstract concept as well, like processing. What does that actually mean? I know if yeah. a certain event happens that inspires a certain emotion that it's going to go a certain way and you can't avoid it. You've just got to go through with it because otherwise it's the ele- elephant in the room that gets bigger and bigger. But when it comes to grief and being autistic, it's very different for me that you can't say, right. I And, you know, and I think it's also sometimes this kind of neurotypical, very neurotypical idea of like processing or how we should grieve or how we should do things or, you know, and if we don't process something or deal with it, you know, we're going to forever be damaged by it. Well, you know, you can't def- you can't define trauma. We're all just a collection of neurology and experience and traumas and, and you know, experience, you know, what defines a trauma? A, a trauma is defined as an experience that shapes you in and felt negative what about the positive ones that's not trauma is that happy trauma so it's very like there is no way to I think that we've just got to be really careful that we don't apply too much neuronormativity to autistic experience of processing grief and you can't gaslight yourself to say oh if I don't go through this if I don't feel sad at a particular time if I want to fix things if I do it doesn't mean that you know, you love, you know, somebody any less or you miss them any less. Um, and it's just, for me, autistic people are really good at being horrible to themselves. And Definitely. things like how you should, and, and you know, I have this mm-hmm. with my neurokin all the time when they're constantly struggling. It's like, oh, you know, we'll, we'll sit there and we'll pick things apart and stuff. And, mm-hmm. and we always have to throw in the comments, that's not an excuse to be horrible to yourself, you know? And 
for me, it's, yeah, just don't apply neuronormativity. There is no right or, or wrong way. And I think because we grow up surrounded by neurotypical culture, we have this kind of like processing and dealing with things and going to therapy for things. And I'm not saying that that is a bad thing for autistic people, but you have to be aware that that may not necessarily apply to you in the way that you've grown up thinking it does. So if that even makes sense. And yeah, I mean, you can think about processing, like that person said, I need to be alone, I need to, you know, process it in my own way, and whatever that way is, and however long that takes, that is okay. And yeah. the most important thing is to be kind to yourself, because once again, that you know, we yeah. find every way possible to beat ourselves up. So, and talking yeah. about that in yeah. relation to men as well, so we have Northern yeah. Aussie. As a male, it was difficult to grow up in a small northern town and show emotions, I would inevitably suppress them. And I think that is very much the case um, mm -hmm. within our society that's, you know, suppressing emotion, especially as a hyper empathetic person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that, you know, and I, I don't know what it's like, um, you know, to be um, mm -hmm. grow up as a male in a society, but I'm, I can't imagine because I suppress my emotions all the time because I know people have judged me based on my, mm -hmm. you know, effective empathy based on, you know, just crying at a, <laughs> like, oh, that's unprofessional, or, you know, oh, that's, you know, that's a little naive, or that's, that's, you know, you know, young, why, why, you know, why can't you do that? What were you going to say, Bobby? No, I was, I just raised my hand in agreement, but like, um, I, I yeah. totally understand this idea of, of, of uh, holding in and masking your emotions, because, you know, you're going to be judged for them, completely judged for them. And I think, you know, female presenting people, female born, born people, trans female people deal with this on a, such a, a massive level, especially autistic, um, because we are constantly seen as being over emotional anyway, right? And I constantly mm -hmm. battled this because I've got two boys. Now my youngest um, um, male born, um, they um, incredibly hyper empathetic, incredibly emotional, right? And I refuse to have them branded as being weak or 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 uh, irrational or anything like that because they were just as emotional as me and i sort of saw how how i dealt with it and how what came my way about you know heaven forbid i'd be emotional about something I'm, you know oh you're so passionate about this and oh if it's too much passion we need to dial it down mm. but that's all, all emotion right so with my youngest i refuse to have them be altered any way by that. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like I tried my best in raising them to say, you know, if they were upset, yeah, cry, feel free to cry. That's the emotion you're feeling. What, you know, feel mm -hmm. that, understand it so that when it comes again, you recognize it. Like it's really important if you need to show it, there's no problem in showing it. And thankfully in my family, nobody cares. You, you know, mm -hmm. you ball your eyes out here. Nobody, nobody cares in that point of judgment. But it's a, an area that we deal with and the community deals with. And I think the marginalized uh, uh, members of our community deal with extremely on a daily basis, mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. constantly. And especially if you're hyper empathetic and especially if you're dealing with the lexithymia, you know, and not uh, necessarily understanding you know, what to do with that compassionate empathy that you're having because you're young. Mm -hmm. It just it all becomes all very complicated. Sorry, I'm going off again. I saw it. Yeah. yeah, I was just looking at this comment. Actually, I went to logical lists and organising mode when my dad suddenly and shockingly was twenty two. So yeah, I do this. Yeah, I do this, but I actually think this is part for me ADHD because in order for me to process something, yeah. I need to be distracted to work through it. So, but yeah. Um, I think, again, that comes back to neuronormativity. Family think that I'm cold. And, and this is the, the thing, isn't it? Because when you're going through something that is emotionally overwhelming, the last thing that you can then do is turn around and say to somebody, um, <laughs> Chloe's just popped in the comments, she's not ADHD. They are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, um, you know, the last... <laughs> I forgot I've lost my train of thought completely now. But, you know, the, the last thing that you want to do when you're literally on the edge and this comes back to compl keeping yourself regulated if that's what you needed to do to be able to keep yourself regulated and to be able to do the things that you needed to do 
because you know it, it, emotion is a very overwhelming thing um and we need to be regulated and we're constantly trying to keep ourselves out of meltdown if we can we just do so it doesn't it makes sense that autistic people do do that because yeah that's that's how they deal with it and there's no right or wrong way to deal with anything really um no. and so i always think that if your family think you're cold or i mean this is probably i'm pretty out there anyway but what other people think about you is really none of your business and and obviously if they've lost people as well um there's a lot of projection there as well there's always a lot of anger isn't absolutely. there when people lose people and absolutely stuff. I went through that. I went through that in June, you know, and I was because I was the one that was left in in in, in, the, in the property of my mother um, for two weeks, packing everything up. Suddenly, I was the heartless one. I was the cold one. No, I'm the one that organized the cremation. I'm the one that organized. Her, I was with her when she passed. I organized her removal. Everything. I organized everything because that's what I had to do. And you exactly what you said, Tanya. It was me going into the ADHD part of me that says organize, organize, organize. This is what needs to be done. Do this. And then afterwards, possibly you'll have time to deal with the emotion. Do you know what yeah, I mean? And, yeah. yeah. And, and do you know what? it's normal. It, neurotypical people mm. do that. Um, it, do you want to pay cash or check with interest? You know, do we want to go through this now? Can we afford, do we have, can we account the spoons to go through this now? Or is it going to catch us later? And that's mm. not just unique to autistic experience, I don't think. Yeah, and I think mm. um, I'll just read out the rest of the comment. I still haven't processed it properly as the imagery is distressing, but my dad's family thought I was cold and that couldn't have been further from the truth. I'm now 38. And probably this person thinks in pictures, which is see, Chloe, yes, hyper, um, <laughs> hyper font. Um, and um, that that makes total sense to me that that actually it's traumatic mm -hmm. to even think of it because it's so visually there when you know when Chloe thinks of something that they're in it um, so that makes sense that it would take time mm -hmm. for them to kind of yeah. to deal with that and 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 be prepared to step back into that moment um, where for me it, I I can't do that so mm -hmm. I I it's um, possibly I'm up. Uh, even more emotional <laughs> probably because that's how I process it in a way I process through mm -hmm. feelings which is really interesting just to think yeah. the difference in the way that people think affects how we communicate in so many yeah. ways and, um, and things, I wonder if we can have a bit of both sorry yeah. to interrupt I wonder if we can have a bit of both because because for me I was when I when I was with my mom when she passed so that image is and and I'm there I'm there mm, when I think of it so I've put up other pictures around to sort of change it in a way but it's also the emotion as well so it's it i wonder if you can have two processing ways if that makes sense like you can be a little bit of the the emotion part so any kind of emotion will bring me back to it as well but the emotions in the picture does that make sense yeah no i'm the same so i very much think in pictures but also yeah. sounds. I mean, I don't know, like songs pop yeah. through my head that have been in certain yeah. situations that kind of produce a deja yeah. vu. If you've ever been sat in an academy social with me, literally every five minutes, it's new song lyrics coming out. Um, because And it's always really inappropriate as well. Um, but also feelings. So the feeling comes straight back up for me and it's overwhelming. It's massively overwhelming. Yeah. So just all the things for me, um, which is massively overwhelming, which is probably why I, have, I avoid a, a lot because that's what I need mm. to do. Um, mm. But yeah, so one of the advantages for to um, being a hyperfan as well is the ability to shift that quite quickly. Or it could right. be a disadvantage because then you may not pr process. But yeah, it's really, um, it, yeah, it's quite traumatic. When you don't think in pictures, it can be frightening as I don't have anything to hook the emotions into. That's yet. very true. Yeah. yeah. And, and not being able to describe what that emotion is to yourself and just, yeah. And, you know, mm. there's a certain emotion I kind of attach to depression, which, you know, when it, when it happens, I think, oh no, but I don't necessarily really know what that emotion is still. It's, it's kind of a, it's a dark hole really, which is quite interesting. Make your own word. Yeah, Make I know. <laughs> you know what? That's, that's the best 
thing that like me and my family have done instead of like trying to apply neurotypical words to emotions because and not just that but like neurotypical emotions are so basic aren't they you've got like happy sad depressed joyful you, nobody ever just feels just one well maybe neurotypical people do just maybe. one emotion at the same time there's always a different flavor of there's a you know probably a thousand different flavors of happiness um, and I always try and do it through physical feelings as well. Like, how does that make me feel in my body? Because it is a very physical thing for me when I react. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I was a TA for years, for eight years. So, and I worked specifically one-to-one. -one. Um, and before I left, they were putting um, me in with groups of kids, autistic kids. Um, and, and I'm supposed to carry on the, the uh, SLT work, and social skill. Oh, you can imagine. Um, but it came, it, they gave me these pack of emotion cards that I'm supposed to be working with these, like, <laughs> excuse me, five year olds, six year olds with. Mm. Half of the emotions I didn't recognize myself. Like, I had to look them up. <laughs> like, what, you know what I mean? And, and like you said, like, are, are, you know, does anybody have just one of these facial emotions on their face? I mean, what about the ones, the microaggressions and the micro things that we notice? Because we can see the, the changes in the faces. Right. So I ended up using a mirror with these kids and I said, you show me you're happy. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. it, better for me to have them understand their own emotions and what their own facial features look like when they have that emotion. than just come mm -hmm. up with these stupid parts of these Definitely. kids that are trying these emotions that I don't even freaking understand what they were. I mean, how mm -hmm. what is bored look to you? Seriously, because for me, it's the, the hey. resting beat. That's bored to me. Mine's just sounds like meh is definitely an emotion. <laughs> yes. Or, Sorry, my oh, that's an emotion or <laughs> is an emotion. You know, it, that, that's that's how I experience emotion. Do you know what the other factor is as well on hyper empathy, um, which is a massive, massive thing for me? I get secondhand embarrassment so bad. So bad. Grin, oh, grin, yeah. yes. Oh, no. <laughs> It's it's the worst. It's like panic attack inducing for me. Yes. Oh, I have it, to turn it, TV shows off that. when they're like that. I just can't. I can't. Mm -mm. Like The Office, right? Everybody's into The Office. A couple of friends of mine, not everybody, a couple of friends of mine are, are into it, like the American version and the British version. I can't watch him. He makes me cringe. Mr. Like Bean. Literally slap, yeah. Slapstick comedy again sorry oh. makes me angry it makes me angry because i'm like you are making me cringe why are you making me have this experience but then because of the emotional connection um you know and the fawning and the masking every time that you it just brings up that emotion of embarrassment which then links back mm. to every time you've probably not understand something social or put your foot in it or done something embarrassing. Oh my Lord. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly yeah. traumatizing. So yeah. <laughs> so the cringe thing for me, like the effective empathy, crying stuff, fine, not, but yeah. So even watching people perform, even if it's not particularly embarrassing and that comes back through to exposure anxiety as well, I think. It's totally exposure anxiety. Um, Absolutely. I sometimes struggle to watch people perform. Not yeah. because it's embarrassing, but because of the exposure that's involved in that. Um, yeah. so and it, would you, it's that cringe would, thing. Would you describe exposure anxiety? Yeah, go um, on. So, Bob. yeah, Ex exposure anxiety. So I was really close to Donna Williams, who is an autistic author and, and artist, and she did everything. She had really problematic views in certain points in reference to biology and reference to autism that we did not agree with. And we all constantly argued about. But the one thing that she did for me was she ex described exposure anxiety, which was my youngest, absolutely a thousand percent. And exposure anxiety is literally the excruciating sense of, of literally audience to one's own existence. So it is this feeling that everybody's watching you and can understand every thought that you're having at all times. Doesn't matter if you're walking down the street, you immediately assume that everybody's watching you and everybody's looking at you. If you're sitting in a classroom and the teacher calls on you, my youngest, because they were bombastic in their reactions, would kick a desk and run out the room. Mm. Like that was the reaction to the teacher literally calling on them for a question. And the, the, the only time it ever happened is when a substitute stepped in. 
So, but when they were growing up, it was a matter of me teaching them as if I was doing it for myself because you can never directly teach them. They would immediately crawl underneath a, a, a table or kick you or, you know, it was, it was literally fight or flight. But when you taught them in a reference of, of doing it as for myself or pretending I didn't know how to do something, then, then absolutely you, you caught them. And that's when I realized, um, and, and, and it benefited me working as a TA, the parallel play with autistic children is everything. Like it's everything. You know, you yeah. gain their trust, they understand you, and it's fun. It's actually good fun. So with my my little one, you know, at the time, we parallel played all the time. So to this day at 21, they will still, they still come to me to understand certain emotions and certain things. And their exposure anxiety is lessened to the point where they're able to get a cab to college by themselves and back, which yeah. would have never, ever happened. Like that was an absolute this child can't go out to the store by themselves or go on to public transport by themselves because of the exposure anxiety. You know, and it's um, so tied one... in. Yeah, isn't it? It's so Are tied you... into hyperempathy because yeah. it's a really reasonable oh. and logical assumption that if you're picking up kind of any feeling that's happening in the room, then every other person is picking up that feeling too. No. And you yeah. really have to, you know, I've I've worked with um even adults that, that we've had to sit there and go, actually, these neurotypical people haven't got a clue what you're thinking, pal. You might yeah. know what they're thinking, but I can promise you they haven't got a clue. And even if they think they might have, you can just deny it. It's fine, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's that excruciating audience to one's... It, it, literally, yeah. you feel I totally like get that. World is an audience to your existence. That's what it is. So, you know, and as, had... as a child, you can imagine how much diff more difficult that can be. Thankfully, if you understand it, you can kind of work with it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, it, it's just, it's learning that people really don't have a clue what's going off inside your head and that you are hyper empathic and that you pick on, mm -hmm. on the minor and whether that's safety, whether that's trauma, work, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that not everybody yeah. has that skill. Because it is an autistic skill. Yeah. It's a double-edged yeah. sword, yeah. but it's absolutely, absolutely that was a skill. Though. Absolutely. And that was the breakthrough. The breakthrough was finally realizing that not everybody had that skill. Not everybody was like that. So therefore and it was easier to do things because at the end of the day, exposure anxiety, and we know a demand avoidance exposure anxiety reduces massively, you know, when, when the environment and, 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 and everything around is working as, as it should be. And when the anxiety is reduced, suddenly it's not so much of a demand. We know that. And you're the one that told me about pace. Pace is everything when it comes to understanding, you know, the, the autistic experience in, a, in of itself, let alone one that's a, a demand avoidant and, and hyper empathetic. Yeah. You know, so and, just, and I'm just going to explain the pace model. So um, because we work a lot with children and neurotypicals love a good strategy. Yes, they do. And a lot of strategies are very... ABA based and how can I get my autistic kid based etc cetera, etc cetera. so um to kind of fit in with that I we tend to you know okay these people want a strategy what strategy can we give them so we kind of go with the therapeutic parenting pace model which is based on playfulness acceptance um commute what is it playfulness acceptance communication and empathy uh, so playfulness, acceptance, compassion and empathy and, and the way that you respond into a child. Um, now, for anybody that knows neurodivergent or trauma children in the way that we do, um, that it just basically wraps it all up in a model. So, yeah, um, parenting and actually it's very anti-ABA, but it's used yeah. very much throughout social care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it tends to be just and and, you know, I even even people i think that we should be approaching people in that way as well um but yeah well i do and and you know when we talk about the lower, low arousal approach which is very much about being aware of what emotional energy and what you're bringing to a situation rather than the other person and if we are teaching that to people that are around autistic people they can't go far wrong but yeah it's um it, it's kind of the way that we as professionals manage to kind of nip in the bud routine and boundaries and all of that neurotypical imposed crap by going, no, actually, therapeutic model, that's what we do, go away. But yeah. Resilience. Building resilience. Yeah. We need to build resilience. Oh, I'm like, oh, oh no. Yeah. I mean, and, 
and I really, you know, I, I definitely have experienced exposure um, mm. anxiety in the past. And, and it took me a long time to realize that the world didn't, I mean, I kind of tell myself the world doesn't revolve around you, Annette, that, you know, <laughs> nobody knows what you're thinking. Nobody is watching you constantly and, and nobody is um, judging you constantly. I think that was, you know, but and it's not my fault because it was always my fault. Everything was my fault. Yeah, but constantly. even that attitude is turned into a way to beat yourself up, hasn't it? Like the world doesn't revolve around <laughs> me, you know, and this yeah. is the real kind of like touche autistic brain, touche <laughs> warning, touche masking. But that, yeah. that's the thing. And so it, it doesn't matter what we say or what we do. It's not about the world not revolving around it. <sighs> It, it's oh yeah, weird. definitely. How that, do yeah. autistic people always it's manage not to me. make it in their hole? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's the way yeah. we talk to ourselves. It literally is. It's the way we talk to ourselves. And that is yeah. that is, you know, if anything else, that's the eternal ableism that we are all actually yeah. dealing with. That, that that voice in our heads that says, Okay, you're fine. The world doesn't revolve around you. And I totally get where you're coming from. Like I totally because that's what my youngest says to themselves. So I but I'm like, can we come up with a little bit more positive spin on that? Yeah. Like can yeah. we can we think of more positive? Yes. And it's hard. It's hard yeah and yeah. can we just like try maybe we should try something because we're all sat here going oh you know hyper empathy is really hard to deal with and it's really difficult and it's burning out but actually it makes me really really good at what i do exactly it, it's yeah. a real positive in some respects you know i think even it really helps me draw like cross the and even being hyper fan because I, I explain things in very visual simple formats as well um it helps me cross the double empathy divide a lot. Yes. Um, you know, it helps me, you know, if I'm trying to explain something, whether it be in writing or whether it be spoken, it helps me bring the emotion to it that I need to. It helps me pick up on the emotion that the parent or the child or the professional might be feeling. So, yeah, it's, it, there are some real positives to it as well. And I think yeah, it is absolutely. a thing that's born out of necessity. I think we are hyper empathic because we have to be to keep us safe. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, I think question. we got um, Charlotte Brooks here. Does anyone else not feel the hyper empathy or recognize uh, other feel others feelings in the moment because you're masking instead it just builds up. So they don't not feeling the hyper empathy or recognize other feelings in the moment. I think definitely. And I think, it builds up just like sensory exposure and um, builds up. And I think we get overwhelmed by things that we were not consciously aware of as well. Um, and it depends. It depends on that monotropic attention. If you're in a specific environment where you're trying to manage sensory stuff, social stuff, other people's emotions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, for your attention to be pulled in that way is not always going to be. And that's OK. Um, and I think as well, we have to be responsible for our own emotions a little bit as well. So we can't really beat ourselves up for not recognizing others. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I, I do think, yeah, rephrasing all those things. And it's it's, it's a constant learning process, isn't it? Because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm constantly telling other people to rephrase um, all the negative words that they've learned to, to turn in on themselves. Um, but, you know, you know what? Ableism. We're a product of our environment. We're, we're, we're a product of of the way that society speaks and how we read, especially as researchers or people that have gone to uni. I mean, you, you've read, you've read research about autistic people. That's what all I'm going to say on that. Oh you know, yeah. When, you know, when, when <laughs> somebody, go, when you tell somebody you're autistic and they go, sorry, and we're, you know, so the big things we are aware of, but the little nuanced stuff, it, you know, it's a bit like there's a lot of real, real, insidious racism and sexism and, and classism and things that we don't experience you know it doesn't mean that we're bad people but we it's a constant battle yourself to not be ableist to yourself as well and you don't even realize that you are doing it most of the time because it's just how we grow up but yeah oh yeah well, it's, it's yeah gratitude it's also the strategies that we do. Like I said earlier before, like there was a time in my life, I know for a fact that I self-medicated and there was a reason I was doing so. So it was masking, masking, masking because of the work I did at the time in my twenties, I worked, um, you know, in restaurants and stuff. <laughs> of course I'm going to be masking some, if I'm a waitress, come on. So, you I know, know masking. 
and then yeah. needing to release because I'm taking up because being hyper empathetic. So, you know, every argument that's happening between customers and stuff, I'm sort of like, you know, suddenly on edge and then literally going out, getting drunk and dancing all night. Like that was the routine, you know? So we also do that too. We kind of put our, you know, different strategies in place. And thankfully it didn't take me too long to realize a better strategy than that. You know what I mean? Um, and that self-medicating wasn't actually going to always work because it's always going to be there kind of thing. Well, it's you know, a spoons you know extender. I mean? It's a spoons extender, isn't it? That's what self-medication yeah. is, whether it's alcohol, drugs, whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, also, it's a, you know, it's a spoon extender for that period of time, and then it exactly. takes more spoons it's later, doesn't it? So yeah, it's not yeah, really exactly. an extender. I think yeah, as well, sorry, no. it, the, the hyper empathy thing as well, and I see this a lot, and I'm going to try and explain this. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes you seek that out. Sometimes you seek the big emotional experience out as well. So I think very much it can be quite an enjoyable experience, not enjoyable. Mm -hmm. It's like a stimmy experience to dive into yeah. that kind of emotion with somebody else that's theirs. Um, and I think, you know, in a way, it almost it, it's like a bit of an interceptive stim. It's like Bobby was saying, mm -hmm. sometimes I want to feel sad. You know, sometimes we need that relief sometimes. And, and I think as well that sometimes specifically children as well that are having a really hard time can fall into that kind of interceptive stimming um, in a really negative way as well. So we have to kind of bring it back positive. And this then ties back into PDA because PDA is, um, you know, I love them. But they're absolute mm -hmm. masters of understanding the energy levels and manipulating the mm -hmm. co-regulation of what's happening in a situation. They they mm -hmm. just understand how to control the co-regulation. Um, and manipulating is never a bad word either. But yeah, it's to, it's that need for that interceptive stim as well. We need sometimes we need that. Um, and oh, I don't think bad it's music. really bad. Yeah. Hi guys. Oh that's yeah. It. Yeah, thanks, guys, because this is Charlotte again. I sometimes reflect and think I've come across as callous, but that monotropic explanation makes a lot of sense. Oh, that's really good. Happy yeah. Mm. Oh, sorry. I feel like, oh, oh, what is that? Oh, yeah, and once again, I think that is important, and we that came down. That's a huge thing to learn, that in most cases, you're not responsible for others' feelings, and that's really yeah. important mm -hmm. to understand. There can um, be an awful lot of confusion. <laughs> Yeah, they and especially if you fall into go to the into, into people, please. Sorry, apologies. Mm. The, it's codependency as well. There can be an awful lot of codependency, I think, as well with it when you are hyper empathic because, and the codependent person isn't the person that needs you; it's the person that needs to be needed, actually. Yeah. So that was an interesting learn. But yeah, and it can be and that interceptive stimming kind of thing as well. But um, yeah. We have to be really careful and we have to be careful of bumping into people. Oh, I often become mute when talking about feelings, whether mine or someone else's. So people will say have no empathy. And that's it, isn't it? That's it. And I think that's the thing. Like sometimes I'm in a situation where I do not know what to say because I'm so overwhelmed by the emotion of what's happened. Like there's no words. And then I just end up going. Mm hmm. And just you described my youngest in one hit. Literally mm. described my youngest. That's exactly my youngest. And it is that. Uh, and it's because the, mm. it's it's. I think because alexithymia comes into the play as well, and 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 the hyper empathy sort of intermix, and and it is literally. I don't know what to do. That's why why I'm saying what I'm saying. That parents, when you see your child in that situation, you need to tell them what to do, or tell them what what is a possibility, because in my understanding of my youngest when they explained it to me they're stuck they literally are stuck and they want to help they want to do something just have no idea what to do and how to communicate it but are you yeah, that now? yeah oh sorry no. yeah i mean i think no i was just going to say that you know that, um ben has said i often feel mute when talking about feelings whether mine or someone else's so people would assume and say i had no empathy when in fact I have half hyper empathy and just struggle to communicate it. Yeah. And what you were saying, Bobby, I think oh. that's incredibly mm -hmm. true that, um, you know, there's so much miscommunication and that brings us back to the double empathy problem. 
you know, the, the idea that actually autistic people don't have, you know, um, perspective taking ability when it comes to, um, you know, neurotypical people, but it goes the other way. Neurotypical people don't have perspective taking when it comes to autistic people, you know, the way we experience the sensory world and, and, in that, the way we take in all of that information affects the way we think, the way we communicate, the way we feel, um, the way we move, um, everything, the way we socialize. Um, Non-autistic people cannot perspective take what we experience on a daily basis. Um, and and there's, a, there's a real miscommunication constantly. Um, autistic people are, are totally mis, you know, basically mis misunderstood. Yeah. And it, this comes into, I mean, even if, if I've got a friend that's having a hard time, I tend to shut down because, you know, I've, I've had those years and years and years of gaslighting where you're aggressive, you're blunt, you say the wrong thing, you're too black and white, all the rest of it. So the thought that's coming into my head is, oh, my God, I know they're having a really hard time. I know they're going to want to talk about it. I'm going to say something wrong. I'm going to hurt them. I'm going to ruin my friendship. So it you know, it's that anxiety as well, isn't it? And, and that's hyper empathy because if you didn't care about the person, you wouldn't be thinking that. Yeah. Okay, but so yeah. I've got to say that now. You helped me massively in June of last year. Yeah, yeah. You were amazing with me, okay? So when you think, and that's possibly because being both autistic and ADHD, but yeah. when you think you are possibly too blunt and too rude, no, no, my friend, not when you're with your neurokin and not when they're struggling. You're amazing. So I just had to put that yeah. out there. But again, that's, that's again, that's being horrible to yourself. It's the gaslighting. It's the this, that, and the other. Yeah. And it's, it's constantly having to remind you that what other people think is none of your business. I always try and think that as well. And I always think as well that if I do upset somebody and they don't talk to me about it, then I can't have been that important for them in the first place or they're not going to address it or, you know, because ultimately we can only be responsible for ourselves, can't we? Yeah. And that's the boundaries Definitely. you were talking about earlier and having to put them in place. It's all that, that is, that comes into play with the boundaries, you know? Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it's just a whole lot of hyper empathy is rolled up in, it's got its negatives. It's got its, its positives, but it's just all rolled up in a hell of a lot of internalized ableism, self gaslighting, yeah. masking. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Challenges and strengths. Challenges yeah. and strengths. And there's lots of strengths and challenges when it comes to hyper empathy. Oh, God, that's so funny. Can you oh, access yes. the slides and, somewhere, oh, please? Somebody's... Yeah, I, I got to figure out how, to, how I can get them, but I'm sure I can give them to our Academy in, in some form. So, yeah, absolutely, they'll be accessible somehow. I promise. As she says. Oh, fabulous. That's great. Yeah, I don't mind. Um, I don't mind great. putting them out there. Oh, yes, like, yeah, so like, yeah, on a PDF on the website. Absolutely not yeah. a problem whatsoever. Okay. But, yeah. okay. I mean, I think, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? It feels like a natural kind of. I think, I think we've gone over, under it and through it, haven't we? Like been on a bear hunt. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we haven't done anything I was thinking is. <laughs> I really liked, you said something about your, one of um, your, Oh, your um, children, I think, well, the emotions on the skin. And I thought that mm. was a great kind of, you know, analogy of what it feels like to be hyper empathetic that, you know, mm -hmm. you, you feel, I used to describe it as like my organs were on the outside of my body and that people could just kind of touch them whenever they wanted to. Um, Can I ask and one thing? Did you, not, did you not do something in reference to writing on your skin? Well, I, I mean, I, or was it yeah, I mean, I, I write on my fingers. No, there was um, a project where somebody wrote words on your eyes. Oh, no, that was me. That was me. Yeah, I wrote all the words. Yeah, all the negative I, words all over. I saw a picture and that reminded me of hyper empathy. Like that literally reminded me. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to see the words. I didn't see close enough to see what the words were. But I was yeah. like, oh, my God, that's, that's like exposure, anxiety, and hyper empathy, like in one hit. It was amazing. Yeah. After, like yeah. you could possibly send me a link to, to sort of know more about that. I would be really interested. Sure. Yeah. Mm. I I don't have the images on the internet right now. I'll have to do that. Um. Yeah. But that that was 2015 before I started my PhD, 
I was kind of wow. a person with autism at that point. I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Well, I always say that with my art. I don't know what I'm doing. And then you figure it out afterwards. But um, probably to do with all sorts well, of art's things. Art's one of those things like boundaries and processing, isn't it? It means different oh, things yeah. to different people. Yeah, but no, that so. you know, that was my experience of internalized ableism. So it was basically wow. all the words that I people called me and that I called myself um, as an autistic person. Un, un, you know, at the point time undiagnosed or just diagnosed. Um, but that makes sense that it would relate to high, that would look like hyper empathy as well because it's that intensity of mm -hmm. the emotion and how much of it you're kind of soaking up on a daily basis. Um, mm -hmm. And how much of it you think other people see as well yeah yeah <laughs> see well, everything, everything. Another tangent. My apologies. no 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 that was good what is <laughs> someone said oh yeah I, but, uh, yeah I used I'm, to not gonna it. I'm not gonna answer that question Nor <laughs> naughty, by the way oh that's so, great oh yeah oh look We've got it somewhere. That yeah, I think that's on Facebook somewhere. But that's one of the images. Yeah, I've got that's loads. The one I saw. I mean, yes. Yeah. I've kind of abandoned my work on social media as an artist because of my PhD. But I need to get back to it now that I've actually finished my PhD. Um, yeah, I did an interview. Yeah, I did an interview last week with um, what was his name? Dwayne, American, uh, about being an artist and an uh, artistic artist. Um, Dante, not Dwayne. <laughs> He's I know, got, I've just got Dwayne the Rock John, Johnson coming into my yeah. head. Yeah. <laughs> you smell what the rock. See, this is what just pops into my head continuously. It's not pictures. It's, yeah. See, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's great, though. I mean, I think I was talking to somebody that they think in words. And mm -hmm. I, I definitely think I, because I was like, how do I memorize things? And I was thinking, I think I do think in words. So that's probably how I memorize quite good at memorizing if I put the work in um, but I don't obviously mm -hmm. think in pictures which is really interesting but that, once again mm -hmm. I digress okay let's let's to end <laughs> I'm going to ask you guys what your favorite stim is or what is uh, the new something new stimmy that you have or that you're enjoying oh so literally what I'm doing I have a finger spinner I have two of them one makes noise oh, nice. very nice and the other one doesn't, but it's a chain and it kind of feels nice. So this is literally my latest. I'm constantly wearing it and I'm constantly flicking it. <laughs> oh, oh, I think mine, mine's favorite stim, anything squishy, anything proprioceptive. So I literally sat here with my legs because I'm quite hypermobile. So with my legs like wrapped around each other twice, my hands in between my thighs, like squeezing constantly proprioceptive seeking so anything that's squishy not weighted blankets so they just don't really do they're just not enough so bear hugs really Ooh, bear like hugs. a big squeezy yeah anything that's squishy nah. and music because of the the kind of interception kind of emotional stim that i get from that i find it really cathartic nice so yeah sounds lovely okay and what is your favorite form of potato <laughs> I'm so American French fries. <laughs> now thin, thin, thin French fries. Yeah, that's kind of thin or thick. Oh no, they have to be thin. They have to be French fries. Proper thin French fries. Oh, French I do fries. not like French fries. fries. Do not like the British chips in any way, shape, or form. I'm so American. Oh. <laughs> I'm really. <laughs> I, I, yeah. So I'm really spoiled with this because my stepmom's actually a classically trained chef. So you can imagine all the wonderful things that French people do with potatoes. I can't even remember what it's called, but they slice them really, really thin. Scallop. No, Scallop. Tiny, like really, really thin. And then they put garlic butter in them and then they weight them. Yeah. And then they all move. And then, oh, pom, Anna, maybe? I don't know. And anything that yeah, French that's the American. Do. Americans would say scalloped, but I know it's a different word yeah, yeah, yeah. in France. Anything that French, <laughs> people, them in French. Anything that French people do with potatoes, I'm all over it, whether it's Dauphinois, Parmano, whether it's Bondon, I like, yeah, just give me the carbs, all the carbs. Best question ever asked. <laughs> it's ben. I think it's Ben's question. <laughs> so, of course. Oh, and we have oh, to no, have. No. Oh, oh, no. yeah. oh, to mayo, of course. Um, no, salad cream. Salad cream. Equally. Salad cream all the way. Hashtag yeah. 
Miracle Whip. I'm sorry. I have a jar in my fridge. Hello. You're the only person I've ever spoken to on Academy that actually said Miracle Whip. Because I always talk about it. And people are like, what the hell is that? Are you insane? Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm a hummus fan, I have to say. I, I oh, I like it. Them. Hummus is not a sauce, though. Hummus is not a condiment. Because I don't think you have hummus with something. I think hummus itself is the meal. And whatever you're dipping in is just the kind of sideshow. No, hummus yeah. bread vegetables shoved in, yum. Yeah. yeah, you can use it as a sauce. You have, yeah, yeah, I mean, I but think it's you just can, not, but it's not always a sauce. It's got to be the main event, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. yes, but um, Nick Walker, that was their answer, hummus, which I always think, yeah, totally hummus. Yeah, yeah, I love hummus. <laughs> I live on hummus, brown food, yes, all the way. Okay, so next week we have, oh, where have I written it down? Um, oh, next week we have communication and accessibility with Angela and Justina. I, I've, Justina. I've said it wrong. Yeah, I am. Just, what is it? Justina. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, which will educate us on communication and accessibility. And thank you all for listening and for coming tonight and see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.